Um, yeah, yeah, so since we were on the album, it's, um, well, first of all, it's such a well-written album, so thank you so much for that. And But it's also a very complex one in terms of the elements it involves with the ode, uh, with the orchestral arrangements and things like that. Um, can you run us through um, and share what was the process like for the album? So you did mention a bit that it started with uh, the Cataclysm and then what happened after that? How did you, um, like step by step, literally how did it happen from one song to an entire album? Yeah, you know, what is really important for me as a composer, you know, I want to have um, a concept. I want to have, uh, you know, an inspirational force that drives me. It sounds a little bit, you know, artistic, and but uh, it's really what uh, drives you to have endless elements to work on it. If you create images in your head, then it's very, very easy to, um, I don't know, to make these images into music. So, uh, Cataclysm was great, but unfortunately, we didn't have a solid concept back then. Uh, Cataclysm was uh, the first single, uh, but the whole solid idea about a single um, alchemist that initially was good, but then went um, uh, rampage and berserk and murdered his old uh, king and all that stuff came afterwards. So um, <laughs> we wanted the concept and we wanted colors about the concept. Um, it, it was not really and well uh, described at first, but we want something massive, something majestic and something sinister. And, um, you know, a big part uh, was my orchestral libraries. It, it, it sounds a little bit weird, but if you have something that sounds so good, it's really inspirational. So uh, these were the first two things. The one was the concept about that sinister and um, um, dark alchemist, and the other was the massiveness and the atonal characteristics of the Metropolis uh, Arc 3 this time. Oh, wow, and, Arc 3. You know, yes, the Arc 3 is amazing because it's all the atonal stuff in one library. <laughs> it's, it's super massive. It's uh, unnaturally massive, but it's exactly what we wanted. So, um, you know, I'm, I talk to my bandmates and friends and we start, you know, shaping the idea. Uh, we have an alchemist. Uh, what's he trying to do? He's trying to steal uh, all that archaic knowledge about eternal life and how the universe uh, works. And uh, after that, he went mad and he wants to berserk everything to gain that knowledge. So we structure that idea into different songs. Uh, we wanted to have an intro song. Uh, we wanted to have, you know, that, that's basically um, all the album in one song, but very, very short. Uh, we have an outro song that is kind of large and we wanted to have, you know, a great uh, crescending ending. And we have the middle. So the middle, we have, um, again, some stories, meaning uh, Alchemist has a weapon of destruction, it's called Clock of, Clock of Giant. And, you know, of course, uh, you're writing music and you're trying to come up with riffs and uh, orchestral parts. So it's a little bit of that. Uh, we, we don't have a specific way to construct a song, but that's roughly uh, our mindset. 
Okay, well, I think that's very helpful. I think it makes a lot of sense to have like a picture in mind because without that yes. picture, you have no idea where you're heading and then you, you don't exactly know what sort of story you want to tell or what you're trying to describe or what you're trying to say. So I think I, I do agree in having that picture of what you want to achieve uh, visually, even if it's in your head. Um, yes. I think that helps a lot. And it helps, like you said, you have the metro metropolis arc 3 which is a uh, massive how many gigs is that L like uh plugin it's like is it hundreds in the hundreds it's about 100 i think yeah wow, that's, and it that's... has no no sustained instruments it's 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 not has you know long strings or brasses it's everything like uh, percussive elements ah, it has wow, so um, ricochets it's got uh, you know marcatos mm. it's got um, for the pianos, the clusters, it's got all the atonal stuff. Okay, wow, that's that's good to know. Um, well, so then having that sort of massive library, how do you sort of decide what to use? Because wh what I find myself struggling with is which uh, instrument do I pick? Say because I use the East West uh, cloud. I'm with the cloud composer now. So I have so many things. And then one of the challenges I find most of the time is like, OK, wind. You have so many choices when it comes to wind. Uh, horns, you have so many choices. You have percussions, you have so you have Persian, you have Asian, yeah. you have Chinese. Um, in your case, how do you decide and how do you sort of determine what is enough? Because there's always the temptation to add more instruments, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There is. And, uh, uh, you know, when you're registrating and composing for a trailer stuff, meaning you don't have the metal band with drums, uh, bass <laughs> and guitar, it's way harder because if you put a um, few elements, it doesn't sound really as massive. There's always something missing, but I guess the easy part is when you're orchestrating metal music because less is more. Uh, a brass alone can be so massive in the metal context. But, you know, again, uh, we come to the visualizing because I had a sound in my head and everything I chose, uh, it, it was complementary to that sound. Um, we want it to be something, you know, not so modern, but massive. Because, and of course, I couldn't use any synthesizers. I couldn't use anything modern stuff. So I wanted something epic, dark, and majestic. So, you know, uh, it was really easy uh, when you have a specific sound in your head. So you want you have to be sure what you want to create first in your head you have you must have something solid and then you will arrange your instrumentation accordingly if you don't want if you don't know what you want to achieve with your uh, instrumentation then yes it's going to be an endless journey uh, looking for libraries and uh, Oh, that sounds good, but it's out of context. But I don't have a context, so yeah, let's put that. <laughs> oh, now it's a cyberpunk. <laughs> but I wanted to make something, uh, you know, more um, uh, more ancient or more uh, ethnic. But now it's something cyberpunk with uh, uh, Japanese uh, koto, and <laughs> it's good. It's good, but. If you don't have a solid idea, it's not that easy. So for me, what it's working is, I, I, I said to myself in the beginning, I want to make a cyberpunk track. I want to make a Doom-like soundtrack. I want to make, I don't know. And, and then the instrumentation comes naturally. Of course, you, you have to try, you know, every library. Uh, these days for you to be sure and uh, when the need uh, comes up you have to know what you're going to use for example um, if I want something atonal I would go to Metropolis Arc 3 or if I want something more uh, not that massive uh, with 
slower dynamics, maybe I'd go to Metropolis Arc 2. And uh, that works for me to have, you know, a clear idea of what I want to achieve. That's it. Yeah, I think that's very true. If not, because um, with the amount of uh, plugins available today, the possibilities are just endless and you can literally go uh, on and on and on and on forever and um, also perhaps lose uh, risk losing that initial concept that you originally had. I mean, that's, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, sorry, I mean, if you don't have a concept, you might actually go on and on to the point where you lose the initial idea. But if you have like a solid concept, knowing exactly what sort of direction you want to take, uh, then that sort of helps. But I guess um, it's it's arguable to say which approach is better. I would say whatever works. So in your case, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to say you, when you have a concept, it's much easier to decide what palette you should use, what sort of cutleries you need to eat with and what sort of spices yeah. you need. Um, but there are also people from another camp where they'll be like, okay, let's stay open um, and then let's see what hits and then Sometimes that's when um, something they come up with something new that they themselves didn't know existed, or they find discover something that wasn't there before. So, um, but of course that is much harder to achieve because you are sort of like blindly uh, looking yeah. for something. Yeah, you know uh, that is what works for me. It's not uh, it will not work for everyone, but. You know, I want to have a, you know, a, a bigger uh, perspective. Um, let's say in the past I've composed albums that were not concept, and always I have the same problem. Uh, I, I was I finished the first track or the second track, and then I was uh, now what? Where should I go from now? Uh, what should I create? I have a million different uh, conceptual elements and, uh, you know, orchestral elements. Uh, it, it's nice to have, you know, a multi-layered, again, album with different concepts, uh, but it, it's not really easy for me. You know, I, I struggle to change concepts. Uh, it, it's not that easy for me to change uh, 180 degrees and make different things. I yeah. want to stay focused on one thing. It's a good or a bad thing, but it's that works for me. Also, I wanted to add about the whole libraries. And um, of course, there are a lot, and that's a good thing. But the bad thing is that we all have access to same libraries. So, for example, if I'm using a very specific sound, you have access to that specific sound. And, you know, at the end of the day, when a composer listens to that, um, it's not really going to say, ah, that's a nice piece of music. He's going to say, oh, that's the Metropolis Arc 3. <laughs> and, you know, it's not really a good thing for all of us to have the same tools. So, what I'm, um, you, you know, I'm experimenting with creating my own sounds. I have an old Greek uh, lyre back there, and I've sampled it. And it's clingy. It's it's not really precise because I'm not by any means good at sampling, but it has so much character, and it's really unique. Unique because it's mine. You know, and uh, that gave birth to uh, our next concept album that we're working on. I know <laughs> it's a little bit early, but... Wow, that's uh, soon. Yeah, we've created some custom sounds. We have sampled some traditional instruments and uh, per Greek percussion and some voices. And, you know, it was really unique in a way that gave birth to the concept. And now uh, our custom sounds uh, driving our, you know, conceptual uh, yeah. orientation, if I'm... 
if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes absolute sense. And I think you've probably reached that point where, because you've done um, orchestral music for a while now and you've explored so many different instruments. I think at, at one point, um, you would want to explore something that's of your own and you would want to create something that's of your own. Um, I think uh, it's pretty natural for that to happen and it takes a lot of effort to even get to that point because yeah. with the amount of libraries that's available now, people can go crazy and on and on in search for the perfect sound instead of getting to the point where they want to make their own sound to sample their own library and things like that. And, and like, I'm so happy to hear that you have sort of reached that point where you are looking for your yeah. own sound. I'm trying, you know, Hans Zimmer uh, has said it in um, a competition. Uh, he said, amazing music, but everything sounds the same. And it's natural because Essentially, we're all using same libraries. Uh, when we're talking about strings, there are a lot of options, but uh, they're limited. They're not that limited. We'll, you will use, you know, uh, the, the Berling strings or the Spitfire Studio strings or the East West uh, Hollywood strings, you know, yeah. but there, you have 10 choices and uh, eventually, you know, and every library has a very distinctive character and it's natural. So, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to use something that someone else has used and it's not really a good thing. Mm. Um, you, you know, you're going to say, but hey, I'm using a guitar. Everyone uses a guitar, but that's really different because the way you're playing, the way you're switching your arm or you're mixing yeah. your guitar is way different yeah. guitar is a very dynamic instrument yeah yeah and that goes with the bass and the drums but with the orchestral stuff nah, not that much yeah i think especially if it's plug-in um i mean all the damn like you said every company has their own sort of specialty and then those the pros would be able to identify like you said that spitfire that's uh orchestral tools that's eastwell sounds and, yeah um, yeah I and you know, as, as I've said, I love Metropolis Harp 3 and I'm, now I'm sad because I can't use it again because <laughs> all my first album, not my first, my the first album is my previous album, is based on that library and if I use that library again, oh, it reminds me so much of the first album and I don't want to use it again. <laughs> uh, you know that that's only that, that that's a problem. You, you can't use the same thing twice. And again, that's something that a lot of composers have said. Um, uh, Hans Zimmer, for example, he creates a unique preset. Uh, let's say for the Dark Knight, he has created a lot of zebra presets. Zebra is a VST, if you know it, is a synth VST. Mm -hmm. And all of the arpeggiators of the Dark Knight. He has created them there, and after the Dark Knight, he said, I don't need it anymore. I, I, I won't use it. I, I will never use it again. So take it. And he's just shared his presets about the Dark Knight. And I have them, and they sound exactly like the movie. <laughs> and now I can sound exactly like Hans Zimmer, but that's a bad thing. Because yeah. it's a good thing for Hans Zimmer, but it's a bad thing for everyone else, because when I put, you know, that percussive and plucky arpeggiator, everyone will say, oh, that's a Hans Zimmer sound. <laughs> and you don't want that. You, you, you yeah. want to create something unique for yourself, even if it's not that good. You know, as I've said, all my samples are flirting with uh, the really bad and unusable stuff, but they're unique, you know? They're unique. Yeah, I get what you mean. And it's pretty yeah. natural because you've gotten that to that point because you've experimented with so many different samples. And um, I do think samples that um, the presets from people like Hans Zimmer help people to, to start to help inspire people to, to yes. be able to make music at home. And I think that's a very important first step. And it, it 
because that makes it so much easier for one to compose. Um, it, it may sound the same, but people actually give composing a chance. And then from there, hopefully they'll find their own identity. They'll be like, yeah, I like this presets, but then it's lacking something that I need, but it's not there. And then hence the, the search for your own sound, which is what is happening to you now, because you know that you can't find what you need outside. Um, you need to create something that's specific and to test out a few things that it perhaps will inspire you in a different way, which thankfully it has. And then like you said, because you guys experimented with uh, th these new samples, your new album is on the way. Yeah, it's going to be a long, um, you know, procedure. It's not going to... We're talking about one year, maybe two uh, in a yeah. row because you know, creating, uh, it's really time consuming for us. Yeah. The only thing that is not time consuming is uh, when we record it and mix it. That's uh, kind of a fast process because I'm mixing and mastering the, all the stuff. So for the most bands, that's a difficult part and very time consuming when you have to send something to a producer and you know, you have back and forth and you know, ah, that's not really my sound, mm -hmm. try that or try that. We know our sound and um, that helps a lot, but only uh, the creating stuff, it's going to be one year ahead or two. Yeah, it's always... We're on the right track, we think. We, yeah. we know we, we, all the sounds are in our head. Uh, and it's going to have a twist the next album. Oh, really? A little twist. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say that much, but um, in one of our tracks, um, we have a guest from Mora. Mora, uh, you know, he has a, um, a vocal part and some lyrics on uh, in one of the songs. And, you know, it was kind of, not liberating, but it adds something that I think it was missing. We're not talking about uh, a full, you know, vocal album, but, you know, that addition here and there, it makes a whole of a difference. Mm -hmm. And not by singing, you know, uh, not necessarily having lyrics, uh, voice and as an orchestral element or narration. That's also a great thing. So, you know, We'll try and incorporate that in our next um, musical journeys. Nice. Well, looking forward to hear that in a year or two. <laughs> well, like you said, it's a long way to go, but I think everything has to start somewhere. And it's the start that's always the most difficult. And you've made that first step already. So it's, the album is imminent. It's coming. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say that. Yeah, let's say that. Let's say that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure it's coming. Well, thanks so much for um, sharing all that. It's interesting to know how you think and how you write because I've always been uh, a big fan of how you write. And in fact, I think I told you before. Before I got into GOC guitars, I was like damn, this guy is good. And then your videos were one of the few that I kept watching. And, um, oh, and, I, and I, in fact, I fell in love with Cataclysm even before I got my GOC guitar. And, um, and yeah, and the way you write, the way you play is, um, is very inspiring. And you're definitely one of those guitarists that I really look up to uh, technically oh, you. and also you. the way you compose. And your ideas are just crazy, crazy, crazy. So are your skills. Thank you. You know, uh, I don't see it like way. I mean, I feel very humbled. And, you know, it, it's really nice to hear uh, this kind of stuff from people yeah, that you, you really admire too. I love your playing. And oh. uh, you're also composing orchestral stuff that, that I really like. So. Um, coming from you really means a lot, but I don't feel, you know, that, um, I, 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 but, I mean, not remotely close that good, but what I want to do in every of my 
uh, you know, arrangements. I want to be bold, you know. Uh, I, I I don't want to be subtle, you know. I, I don't want to be, uh, how can I put, I, I want to make a very big, bold move. If you have an orchestral arrangement, it's going, it's going to be full on, not, you know, just a string in the background. And when you have a riff, I want to go all out. If you have a complicated riff, I want to max it out, you know. It, 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 it's not a good advice, but <laughs> that's in my head, you know. Uh, if I have a breakdown, it's going to be massive. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> it's going, you know, it's like someone punching in your face. I want yeah. that breakdown. Yeah. Uh, you don't, you don't tickle, you don't scratch, you just bash. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, if I, I, I don't <laughs> do in the max level, I, I, I'm not going to do this at all. Yeah. It's like go big or go home. Yeah, go big or go home. So, yeah. you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to come up with different ways to spice things up and um, I'm changing a, a little bit uh, the concept here, but what it's really bad for us, um, guitar players in specific, is the muscle memory. The muscle memory is really a bit and really we can't do anything about it. Um, everyone has grown up with uh, playing licks and licks and licks and licks and when you want to create your music eventually it's going to be licks, licks. glued up <laughs> yeah and that's not a musical thing believe me i've done it um it, 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 it's not really nice it's a compilation of exercises yeah that's very true and uh, it's something uh we all, you, you know, struggle with, and you have to come up with something different. So, what are, I really find uh, helpful is, you know, change your interface. I'm only trying to change my interface. So, what I did is play everything I want, in the piano. I'm a really bad piano player. Really, I'm, I'm a, a terrible piano player. <laughs> uh, imagine that when I know what the tonality is, sometimes I have to count to be on the specific key. Uh, but that's great. You know why? Yeah. Because I have absolutely no muscle memory. Yeah, you, you, and, you, you listen to what you're playing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, my main uh, driver is my ear, and that's amazing. Also, another interface is another analog synth. The more, I got myself yeah. an analog synth. And, you know, you don't have anything. You, you, you know, you don't have a pitch. You don't have, uh, you know, the pitch is created by blending some patch cables and also the rhythm. Uh -huh. So... You, you never actually know what you're going to get, but you know, that's again awesome because there's no muscle memory. Of course, you know, if you have a straight concept again, it will, you will guide it, uh, what you want to achieve. But um, in any case, changing your interface changes a lot. Yeah. And uh, the other thing, uh, th that's really amazing and, you know, guitar players are skeptical about it, is the Guitar Pro. You know the program. Yeah. Yeah, where you program the, the MIDI in there solely yeah. by sound. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a bad reputation, I think, from some bands that, uh, you know, write everything in Guitar Pro, even the guitars, and then re -up the guitars and sounds <laughs> robotic and all that stuff. But it's a great program because most of the times when I'm writing in Guitar Pro, I'm not really playing. Yeah, yeah I'm putting numbers, but uh, again, my drive is my ear, yep. uh, not a shape. 
Yeah. I've already played on the guitar because yeah. we're not really improvising. We're just playing what we know in a slight different way, but that's not really helping us. But if you create something from scratch, something on the piano, a very shreddy part on the piano, and then learning uh, on the guitar, on, on the guitar, you know, you have improved yourself. Yeah. You don't need anyone. Yeah. You're just you thinking yeah. kind of outside the box. Yeah, I get what you mean, because muscle memory gets in the way and at some point um, guitarists start to feel that they are doing different things but using the same approach and even though they're different songs they all sound the same and like you said it's a compilation of licks and regardless of how you try to be different you change the tuning of the guitar there's still some kind of similarity there because the fingers still play the same thing. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I do think it makes a lot of sense to just completely change to something that you're not familiar with. So you're yeah. only relying on what sounds good and not what feels good to your fingers. Yeah, there's a caveat, of course. Yeah. A lot of times I have uh, written something that I can't play on the guitar, <laughs> meaning that's not playable. On the guitar. <laughs> that's not playable by any means. But then again, it's also an amazing thing because you're trying to make something different yeah yeah i do so yeah the, the piano uh, the piano keyboard was um, something phenomenal for me and i think a lot of people um i think jason richardson um uh, does that a lot uh, uh you know he's writing something on that wrong yeah just by clicking on the keyboard yeah. and nothing yeah. else but again, you know, it's it, it's a it's a good thing. It's a really yeah. good thing. Yeah, I think one of his songs, uh, "Tendonitis" or something like that. Um, he actually had like an arpeggiator, and then like yeah. he was literally playing with that, and then he learned the song on the guitar after doing it on the keys, and that was how that song came about. And it's exactly what. You, you, you just said there so it, it makes absolute sense to actually do that and that's what makes every track unique you're still you because regardless of what medium you use one thing that will never change is your ear because what feels yeah. good and what sounds good to you uh, will will sort of be you with you still but the difference is that you are sort of achieving you with a different medium and therefore altogether it's something completely new very fresh and it's not repetitive but at the same time people can still tell that's George yeah yeah and I, I think that that's also the good part because you want to be you and you know even changing all the stuff it's nice to hear something and you're going and you tell oh that's Loomis yeah. And I know that's Loomis because... Uh, because he, he follows you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, that, that's, that, that's, that's exactly it. And, yeah. you know, trying to put in some strings, you know, in the past that helped me a lot, going from the sixth to the seventh string and then the eighth string and then changing tunings and all that stuff. You, the bulk line is trying to change something if you want to come up with something different. Yeah. Even if it's yeah. beyond your comfort zone. Yeah, that's very that's very true. And I think it's every time we go out of our comfort zone, if we survive it, that's where we create something beautiful. And that's where we actually get to the next level and we did. It may be a small step, it may be a big step, but it's there's always some kind of progress if we successfully survive that whole mission of going out of our comfort zone. But we may not. Uh, and what I mean by that, uh, in the last, uh, in my previous album, um, a lot of stuff did not make it to the final uh, album. And I I'm talking about highly experimental stuff and especially using the oud. And by using the oud, I mean our oud player Tassos. Um, we're writing together some parts. Some parts are very good, 
and they group together. It's like, you know, they were meant to be together, but oh man, there are some parts that they are disgusting. <laughs> a, a good friend said to me for one, uh, for one part, it's like putting, uh, you know, a YouTube song on one <laughs> window and then putting another YouTube song on the other window and play them together. That's exactly <laughs> what it sounds like. <laughs> and you know, it, it's, it's really that. After that, I was listening to that part and I said, man, that's awful. <laughs> so yeah, th there's always that with experimentation. Some yeah. things will not work. Yeah, I'm and sure. Even if you force it and you you're, you know, you try to support your initial idea, they will not work. Yeah, exactly. For example, uh, yes, again, we're, now we're using with, uh, you know, we're experimenting with some Balkan elements. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Balkan, uh, wow. Balkan, I, I, I mean, truly Balkan, gypsy stuff. Wow. And uh, they are so gypsy that they, <laughs> they want, they, Trust me, they won't blend together. And you know, Gypsy for you is an ethnic thing, but for us in Greece, we don't see it as you know that ethnic ethereal thing. Gypsy is a, it's more like a, a kids element that we're trying to avoid. Uh, because obviously we are Balkans and we have all that culture and from ethnic to kids is uh, uh, you know, line. Line very thin but yeah. we have tried some things that I like and no one else liked it in the band uh, Nikita, our drummer said we're not playing metal anymore <laughs> And up to some point, yeah, it, it wasn't metal. And, you know, I have gone too far. <laughs> and uh, it, the experimentation went a little bit too far. But, okay, then I think we're back on track again. But, you know, there's there's some limitations with yeah. the experimentation. And yeah. it's, it's good to know it. Or yeah. it, it will be all over the place. Yeah, I think that's that's bound to happen, but I think there's always a risk of hitting a wall where you've tried so hard to make something work, but it doesn't. And I think we can all agree as musicians is that we should never be too attached to an idea, that we are willing to sacrifice everything else just because we want to force it to work. At some point, yeah. we have to just make that hard decision and say, no, nah, this is not going to work. It's a good part. It may be an excellent part, but if it doesn't suit the album conceptually or the song, it may go into the folders or it may just go into the thrash. And um, we just have to de be able to detach ourselves with those ideas um, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. That's really so, frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's a bit, a bit sad, but it, it does have to happen sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, like, thanks so much for sharing so much about how you write and your thought process. So we're going to jump to the next section of...